back to the Cave Escape. This is episode eight, and today we're talking with our good friend, Rakib. He's a PhD researcher at Royal Holloway University of London, and he's been doing his researching ethnic minority voting patterns and uh, social cohesion and social trust. And we're going to be talking to him on a range of issues today. And um, ho I'm hoping to talk to him a bit about the upcoming EU and London electoral, uh, electoral elections. And so, Rakib, thank you for joining us. And if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit, little bit about your research, that would be wonderful. OK, sure. Well, um, I'm currently in the second year of my PhD at Royal Holloway University of London. And uh, my particular research project is focusing on issues surrounding discrimination, social trust, institutional trust and identity across Britain's ethnic minorities, specifically the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black Caribbean and Black African communities. That's wonderful. So, Paul, would you mind opening with some of your questions? I know you've got some some sort of foundational ones about um, why Rakib wanted to go down this path through his PhD research and etc. Shall we start with those? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, let's just start with that. Uh, why did you pick uh, ethnicities and minorities as your kind of specific subject, Rakib? Well, I think firstly, first and foremost, I'm, I'm a member of ethnic minority. My background is a, a mixture of Bangladeshi and Indian. So I'm, you could almost say that I'm personally invested in my own research project. But I think that more than anything, Britain is a ever diversifying nation. So the integration of ethnic minorities is it's important for matters surrounding social cohesion, inter-ethnic community relations. These are issues which are now becoming, which are now reaching the forefront of British politics at a local and national level. And also you could say that the civic inclusion of ethnic minorities in terms of how much trust and confidence they have in political institutions, how much trust they have outside their uh, own ethnic group, and um, just generally how they feel Britain is a, whether or not they feel that Britain is a land where there's equality of opportunity, where there's fair play, where, and also matters surrounding tolerance and openness. This is, well, this is vital to know and improve our understanding uh, in terms of the stability of multi-ethnic societies such as our own. No, brilliant. And, I, and you've, we've, you've got two articles on, I believe it's Conservative Home, which we've yes. read, uh, which actually show us in practice. Uh, and they actually discuss how in current times of Corbyn as, as Labour leader, the, the current ethnic vote has changed uh, quite a lot towards the Conservatives because Labour are struggling to uphold um, their historical ethnic roots. Is, is, that, is that right? Is that a good way of saying Well, I, th I, th I think that Paul, what we have to do is, firstly, not to treat the ethnic minority population in this country as a homogenous block. So we'll have to look at specific ethnic minorities and looking at the voting patterns there. If you actually see in the last election, in a uh, last general election in 2015, Labour's vote amongst the Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities actually remained fairly strong. Where is the issue for the Labour Party is amongst aspirational middle class Indians, which are showing a growing proclivity to uh, switch their electoral support from Labour to the Conservative Party? Right. OK. Yeah. So there's kind of a, that kind of divide now. And, and, and what do you think that means for the future of Labour's vote then? Is that is that a positive thing? Is that a negative thing or is it just a bit of a grey area? Well, I'd, I'd say considering that the aspirational middle class Indian vote is uh, it's quite a it's a quite a crucial vote in marginal towns such as Watford, Swindon, Milton Keynes, and Croydon, which we you would say are quite they're key marginal constituencies in any well any general election really. So I think for Labour this is a genuine problem because Labour used to rely on quite heavily on the middle class socially mobile Indian vote, but they, it seems that that party voter relationship between the Labour Party and aspirational Indians. It seems to be weakening, and I think that's a real problem for the Labour Party. Yeah, of course. It's just kind of a doom and gloom situation for them generally now. That, that's the kind of what a lot of people are painting. Um, but I, I, I would say, you know, we, I was just, we were discussing this. I would say probably the other hand of this is that is it possible that as a consequence, conservatives are losing their grasp on the, their classic, uh, you know, white working class vote or, or middle class vote? And we, we know more about this, but is, is this the reason that conservatives are now losing ground to UKIP because they're getting more of the vote from, say, Indians and perhaps other ethnic ethnic votes? Or is it okay. the case that is it more complicated than that? So, so you're basically saying that, oh, you're, so, you're, you're more referring to that sort of white van man conservatism. Yes. Say. Okay, I'll, I'll be honest, I think 
if we're looking at the number of votes that the Tories have lost to UKIP, I think firstly it's also important to bear in mind that Labour are losing a great deal of votes to UKIP as well as was demonstrated in the 2015 general election. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to look at specifically why voters, why the Tory grassroots perhaps is moving towards or seduced by UKIP's populist appeal, I think there's matters that you have to look in particular, EU membership, uh, UKIP have a fairly uh, clear position on the matter of Britain's position within the EU. And I think there's other issues such as immigration. And then if you're looking at more social issues such as same-sex marriage, um, for, uh, foreign aid and international development, this conservative, uh, the well, actually the coalition government put into law that 0.7% of spending uh, GDP should be 7%, uh, 0.7% of GDP should be dedicated to international development. These are, you could say, liberal policies were, which might sit uneasy with uh, typically conservative, well, high Tory voters, which are more likely to go to uh, UKIP on these particular issues or may relate to UKIP. Right. And it, but then is that not a case of kind of, you know, you, you, you go towards uh, one type of vote and then you lose your other support? And it kind of seems like everybody is they They're almost in an attempt to adapt to other voters. They're losing their base and it kind of becomes a game where holes are continuously being open and filled and there's no real kind of gain by anybody there. Or is there really a substantial kind of. Uh, gain to be made here by 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 a certain party. Are the Conservatives still, you know, g- gaining a lot of ground through their adaptation, uh, adapting, uh, so f- through their adapting to new voters, or are they actually just kind of gaining new ground and losing old ground? You know, um, I think if you, if, you, if you want to focus on the Conservative Party in particular, yeah, or well, sorry, it's are... open to anybody, but just just in this yeah. case of Conservatives, let's say, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think I think just generally you can see that. Well, Labour, their traditional core vote, you could say the white working class, there was a significant proportion of that sub-electorate, you could say, that voted for UKIP. I think what happened ultimately in terms of the 2015 general elections, sure. people who had a fairly conservative position, you could say, on EU membership, immigration, same-sex marriage, international development, ultimately they wanted to see, they, they could have been potentially just a straight choice between whether or not they wanted David Cameron as Prime Minister or they wanted Ed Miliband as Prime Minister. And ultimately they went for the more conservative option and in this case it would have been David Cameron, actually the leader of the Conservative Party. I think if we're looking into the future though, you should, we should also bear in mind that the ethnic minority percentage of the national population is due to become up, we could potentially reach 20% right. by 2050. So I'd say that generally, if we're looking at ethnic minorities, I think that any future electoral strategy for any political party, I think they need to take the BME, black and minority ethnic vote, more seriously. Right. So as a, as a general kind of kind of point to pick from this, uh, and 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 what, just to be more specific, what ethnicities pick which parties generally? You know, I was always told when I was younger that Eastern Europeans generally pick conservatives, and you know, you were saying, for instance, that traditionally Indians used to pick Labour. Can you divulge more about that? Or well, um, if if we're looking at the ethnic minorities that I'm focusing on within my own study, we could say that based on the 2015 general elections, amongst British, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Black Caribbeans and Black Africans, they seem to remain solidly Labour, irrespective of uh, social class. But this this effect doesn't seem to really apply to the British Indian community, which is definitely, particularly the Indian, Hindu and Sikh communities, which are showing uh, noticeable movements towards the Conservative Party. That's interesting. Is there, uh, so I read... Uh, I, I think I read on your article a uh, comment, and so this, you might not know this, but is, is there a reason that, there, that these ethnicities have this historical bias? So on your article, I read a comment that the Indians voted Labour because they gave India independence. Is that is that true, or is that is that kind of historical bias? Uh, that's a that's a well, it's a highly speculative uh, speculative statement, I would say. Sure. I think that well, if we had to just focus on the Indian ethnic minor, um, Indian ethnic minority group in particular, in comparison to other ethnic minority groups, they tend to be more educated. There tends to be a greater degree of social mobility, and with that, there is a potential of moving into more middle class, affluent, predominantly white areas 
which sure. happened to be solidly conservative. So you can almost see a political socialization process where your political behaviors begins to replicate your social surroundings. So this sure. could well be the case um, in regards to the Indian ethnic minority in Britain. So actually, it's not a case necessarily of ethnicity, that it's more a case of social mobility. So yes. I think I brought up to you before the, the, the idea of the C2Ss during Margaret Thatcher's reign, who were the kind of, um, they were the kind of, one second, kind of white, uh, aspiring middle class voters yeah. who propped up Margaret Thatcher. And it sounds like with the Bangladeshis, Pakistanis and, and, and the, uh, the blacks, who, they, they are more working class and therefore stick with labor, as you're saying, right? And yeah. then you have Indians who are now moved up in social mobility right, uh, terms, and uh, therefore looking at the kind of conservative viewpoint in terms of their, vo- their votes. Would that be right to say? Is that yeah, I, I, I think that um, dynamics surrounding socioeconomic integration, I don't think they should be overlooked when, um, when seeing why political behaviour within certain ethnic minority groups differ from others. I think, that's, I think that is a fair point. So it, it would it be fair to say then if, say, uh, Bangladeshi and Pakistani ethnicity, uh, ethnic groups also socially kind of moved upwards, they would also change their vote to conservative? Is that a pattern that you can predict? Or is um, that... that's, that's something that, well, that, that remains to be seen. I think also if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at just not economics, but also looking at maybe geopolitical issues, you can see that the Conservative Party, if you saw the recent visit by the Indian Modi. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, yeah. he, was, he, he, uh, he was given a very lavish reception by the British Prime Minister. Well, I don't, if you look at Jeremy Corbyn, he has said that um, in the aftermath of, well, if you, depending on the findings of the Chilcot inquiry, he would be willing to uh, issue an official apology for the Iraq war. He adopts a fairly, I think most people say he adopts a fairly pro-Palestinian position when looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And he has been, he has been actually quite critical of Narendra Modi's uh, past in terms of looking at um, he's record as chief minister of Gujarat when there were riots between Hindus and Muslims. So I think there's other issues that need to be taken into account where Jeremy Corbyn might actually have a particular appeal amongst Muslim voters. And if you're looking at the Muslim population in Britain, that is primarily uh, British Pakistanis and British Bangladeshi. So there's a number of dynamics that need to be taken into consideration. No, it's very, it's very, very interesting. Um, it, it sounds like a very complex thing to, to this kind of comprehend and, and, and obviously predict, like you say. So, I mean... Um, yeah, but but it's interesting because also I know that Margaret Thatcher made similar moves to Cameron with not Modi but um, uh, Indira Gandhi I think it was back in the 70s uh, and 80s uh, where she tried to also get the British Asian vote and tried mm-hmm. to also get them to to vote for her. So it's obviously quite like a it's a it's an understood um, method of of attracting a, a new a new sort of class of voters or not class yeah. but new group of voters. And I'm not sure if you have anything to ask Kieran right now. No, it's great just listening to, to you two. It's a fascinating conversation. I, mean, I was hoping to turn it to sort of um, near future elections and, and any of the patterns we're seeing with regards to these, these shifts and changes. So my, my question with re- was with regards to the London electoral elections coming up this May and, and whether the, the shifts away from, from Labour by these, um, these subgroups within the Hindus and Sikh community uh, who seem to be voting um, conservative now or, or have been from the last election. Do you think this will have um, a major impact or any impact at all with regards um, to those elections? I think, I think firstly, Kieran, we have to consider that there are different dynamics and different electoral considerations at play if you compare a London mayor election to, say, a general election. Mm. So um, while uh, Indian Hindus and Sikhs in London may be moving towards the Conservatives, in national elections, this behaviour may not be replicated in the mayor election where specific London-based issues, maybe perhaps Heathrow expansion, maybe neighbourhood level crime, transport, they might be at the forefront of the mind of Londoners, particularly uh, during a mayor election. But what I could say, if you're looking at the candidates in particular and their policies, I think the, uh, the Labour candidate, Sadiq Khan, he has plans for introducing a London living rent and a London living wage. Now, I do think that within, say, aspirational middle class British Indians in London, within that uh, sub vote, you could say, there are a number of private landlords and small business owners, and that might well sit uneasily within those sorts of policies. And if you're actually talking about the dynamics between candidates and voters, it would be interesting to see how Sadiq Khan's personal identity, being of Pakistani Muslim heritage, how that might potentially play out in the London Hindu and Sikh communities. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, there, there's so many variables involved. Um, and like I said, they, they tend to shift depending we're talking about local or regional yes. or, or, or national elections and so forth. How do you in your research, how do you isolate those variables and make sure they're not, um, you know, they're not skewing the, the effect when you're doing your, your studies? I, th- I think it's vitally important to obviously look at, you know, individual level demographic variables. So you're looking at things such as education, age, gender, social class. We also have to do it at different levels in terms of it being neighborhood level. Then you look at the individual level. I think it's very important that you have to uh, isolate these factors at different levels because it improves the quality of research. Yeah, exactly. And is there any, are there any particular methods you employ to, to isolate them? Or is it just sort of look, looking at what the studies show about their views on these these particular issues i think i think you have to uh, draw inspiration from the strengths of previous studies which are similar to your own and then you obviously have to uh, uh, perhaps make an informed opinion in regards to the sort of methodology that you uh, decide to go with for your own personal research <clears throat> yeah it's, it's difficult in uh, when you get to the sort of phd level social science there's so many different uh, methods and frameworks you can employ and you have to justify why you're using that particular one Definitely. and not another one and it, it it seems to go go round and round in circles sometimes and it, it can go on it can go on forever it's a difficult task you know it, it, it can be an arduous task at times i can assure you yeah yeah i mean i have to dispel the myth that maybe some uh, natural or hard sciences where they think oh you know these social sciences are just playing around with with numbers and not doing real work but in terms of isolating the particular variables and context and that it's it's pretty tough <laughs> speaking to some uh, some people at kent about how they try and get around those and do it you know i mean let's just say I, i'm not i'm not very good at quantitative analysis and i i can't do the whole numbers game myself so uh, I respect those who do it because it sort of blows my mind sometimes when it comes to all that stuff. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to I'd like to shift gears slightly. I know in one of your articles you you talk about. Uh, by the way, we're going to link to all of your articles when we when we upload this podcast. And for those of you who are listening, you can um, see them below and, and and please do go and read them and check out uh, Rakib's work because he's got a lot of stuff published. We'll link to all those below. Um, That's lovely. Any uh, any um, added publicity is welcome. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. That's what we're here for. So I. I you talk about the issue of discrimination and yes. um, how there's, the, the, there's a big view and there seems to be uh, a very real and legitimate view that there's there's a lot of employment discrimination and other forms of discrimination um, with ethnic minorities in the country. So, so I was wondering from your research, how, what do you think we ought to do as a society to try and tackle this issue? Because obviously it's been present for, uh, for as long as there's been minorities, I guess, um, and, and it's um, fluctuated in, in how serious the issue was, I'm sure, through different time periods. But it's, it's still a significant issue. And um, now that legally everyone's, you know, meant to be equal, but culturally there's still these these pretty huge biases, when it, especially when it comes to employment. I mean, are there any, any things we can suggest or do to help break that barrier? Well, I think that firstly, um, David Cameron, the, well, the prime minister in uh, October last year, he announced a... Uh, blind CV equality initiative. I think that's a very positive step because I do think there needs to be more robust anti-discrimination measures for the labour market. So that's um, basically referring to the use of name blind applications to combat CV discrimination. I think that's a, I think that was a really positive step forward. I think it's important to say that the nature of discrimination may have changed in the UK, maybe following the war, following the Second World War. You could say maybe that the discrimination then was more blatant, maybe more in your face more straightforward but now we have maybe more subtle forms of discrimination that perhaps maybe exist in the labor market or just in general um, consumer markets as well so i think these are things that still need to be tackled and because it pretty much strikes at the heart of the you know that british liberal tradition of equality of opportunity meritocracy and fair play and uh, fairness in general so it's something that needs to be tackled but uh, sorry to interrupt, but do you think that possibly uh, cameron's initiative i mean in your from your article, I kind of had the, the feeling that, he, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but that you're assuming that he put that forward to gain votes, or do you think that was really because he believes in that kind of anti-discrimination policy? Um, well, I don't necessarily know at the know the goings on uh, within the Conservative Party or David yeah. Cameron's mind in Nobody general. Does. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, I would, what I would say is that while it was welcome, the Conservative Party they they could stand to benefit electorally a great deal if they tackle a the discrimination issue quite strongly, particularly within the labour market. 
Okay, interesting. Yeah, sorry, Karen. No, no, it's fine. I, I was going to say, I mean, I know from some befriending some um, so some Asian people at University of Kent when I was when I was um, staying down there for my for my first year, my PhD, that a lot of uh, a lot of the people from a lot of Ch- um, Chinese students who actually changed their name because they and to a, you know a very Western or even English name. Uh, um, I don't know whether they do it legally or they try and formally do it so that when they're if they are um, um, going to a job interview, their name obviously sounds uh, more it sounds more English, so they'll change it to like a John or a George or something. Um, and also, I, I guess so basically they're basically they're anglicising their name. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're having to do that just to get yeah. just to get to the door. Apparently, like if the, uh, uh, exactly d- that they won't even be selected. Um, purely because, well, their name's um, Asian origin, and you know, perhaps at a very personal level, these people think, well, I can't even pronounce that name. I don't know how to do it. It might be awkward if I invite this guy yeah. over here and I make I butcher the guy's name. And uh, there's, you know, <laughs> that 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 would be the softest way of looking at that, right? The harshest way is, oh, well, you know, I, I don't like this this guy. Um, you know, I don't want him working for my company because he's he's you know a different ethnicity. Exactly, exactly. And well, so, uh, Kieran, I'm glad you brought this up because we've had a number of field experiments in Britain which have actually actually proven this so we had a study by Jowell and Prescott Clark in 1970 we had another study by Brown and Gay in 1985 and there was a, the most latest one uh, was in 2009 by the National Centre of Social Research which were basically field experiments where they uh, produced matched job applications and the only change was there was a very ethnic sounding name and there was a very English sounding name and even though they were they were pretty much identical in terms of educational qualifications and work experience, there seemed to be a more favourable response to those with the more English sounding name, which suggests to me that CV discrimination is something that very much exists in this country and it continues to, which is why I bring the importance of potentially a name blind application process where a higher percentage of ethnic minority applicants can get their foot in the door. And once they actually come to that face to face job interview, they can express their views. They can also express the benefits that they could bring to the company, and hopefully that could lead to more successful ethnic minority labour market integration in the long run. Yeah, it's, it's sorry to interrupt, but it's, just, it's such a shame because I've, you know, I've not. Well, it's a shame that this exists because I've, I've studied migration for for my masters, and you know, as you say, after the Second World War, from from the fifties onwards, you really see a massive kind of agitation at, at, at BME, you know, black minority ethnic migration specifically. Uh, even though at the time, you know, in the 50s, you would have maybe more Irish people come over than, say, BME migration. And yet all the, all the legislation and, and all the all the public unrest was directed just specifically towards the BME migration. So it was a very, a very racially motivated unrest. It wasn't, even though there was more migration from Common, from the Commonwealth and from from Ireland, it was still the BME one that was targeted, and even legislation was specifically targeted to stop BME migration. So it's just a, a sad history. So yeah. it's good to finally hear, even if it does mean, even if it is just to win votes, it's actually very pa- empowering to hear that there has been legislation that helps BME people in terms of the workplace, and that you know even. You know, the future is that possibly with people like Indians who are more so- socially mobile now, with that kind of power they bring with that social mobility, that they can actually force more e- equality in terms of, you know, the the kind of various obstacles they had beforehand. And hopefully they'll be the same for the other BME groups as well, um, which, it would, which it is in this case with this legislation. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'll say one thing, Paul. I think it's just a matter of, you know, individuals being given that opportunity to really fulfill their potential, because that's not only beneficial for themselves, it's beneficial for the wider economy and society as a whole. So these, this is a very important issue. Yeah, of course. It's just it's such a sh- it's, a, it's a shame that it has to happen almost. It kind of seems like an almost, yeah. you know, my, the very optimistic side of me kind of hopes that there's a subconscious uh, uh racial you know racist attitude towards people in 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 these positions because you know it, it's sad to hear think that they actually would purposely ignore cvs from bme backgrounds because of their names um it's just sad it's very unfortunate yeah and i think that the levels 
of discrimination, some of them can be really subtle because I can't quote chapter and verse to study, but I'm sure I read, uh, I, I think it's a BBC News report reporting on it, but they, they're talking about that people with particular kinds of accents as well. So even if you are white, like a more work, like a classic yeah. working class or northern accent in an interview compared to sort of the Queen's English home counties or lunch. You'll, you know re- I mean? you'll, you'll receive pronunciation, you could say. Yes, yes, exactly. And that there's even there's even discrimination there because they think, oh, you know, he didn't he didn't say the, the way I don't know the, the way I say potato he didn't, he didn't quite emphasize the way I do it <laughs> so I don't like this guy it's, I, I, I guess is that to do with just you want the, the, the employers wanting to employ people which are most similar to them and those and those tend to be the wealthier class of society who own the businesses and etc potentially I, th- I think I think there are considerations to be made particularly by you know private sector firms and maybe even maybe potentially even in the public sector where you know people might have employees may exhibit a tendency of maybe wanting to employ people which they see which they feel would be a good fit within their company or within their division or just within their team in general but i think if we're just looking at the issue of um discrimination in regards to visible ethnic minorities there's no doubt whether there's it's Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black Caribbean, and Black African. There still remains a ethnic. There are ethnic penalties suffered by all these groups in the labour market, and it's something that does need to be addressed. Um, Rakeep, sorry if go, this goes outside of your area of knowledge, but what legislation would you say has been enacted that, apart from Cameron's last last year, that does actually help that kind of ethnic mobility in in, in social economic circles? Well, I think I think we. we, we 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 mustn't un- underestimate the benefits which are delivered through the race relations act passed in the 70s sure. i think they were used so i think they did they did open up labor market opportunities for ethnic minorities i think what we're talking about now though is the fact that we want we would like to see perhaps as a society we would like to see those opportunities being provided at a greater scale and at the higher levels of uh, the labor market perhaps yeah, of course. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm sure, you know, CEO wise, I, the statistics probably do prove yeah. that a, a large majority of them are, you know, from a white background, uh, white male actually. So it's very much the status quo is very much still in place, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, mm. Do Do we think positive positive discrimination? Uh, I don't know if that's the right term for it. I know in America there's been some controversy around that. Do you think that's something that sh- I don't know whether it's even in effect in the UK in any capacity at all, where there's a a, um, a, a quota system to counteract the the biases uh, in the in the public sector, for example. Does, does that does that work? Do you know is that is that within? Um, sorry, I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think that in regards, I think in America you're referring more to uh, say um, affirmative action measures. Well, yes, yeah, that's what I was looking. Yeah, specifically yeah. directed towards the African American community. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's, I think it's interesting you bring that up because then in the 2010 ethnic minority British election study survey, there was actually a question that was asked to ethnic minorities as to whether or not they'd be supportive of uh, ethnic minorities being given priority in regards to these opportunities. I'd say that perhaps the idea of positive action, I think that it might actually run counter to say, uh, run counter to maybe, you know, certain EU rules on equality might run counter to rules which are um, in British law. But I, I think that more than anything, I think generally what's the case for, well, what's the general case for the ethnic minority population is not so much that they want positive action. It's more that they just want equality of opportunity, which is a fundamental difference between the two, which should be recognised. Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, that's a, I think that's a pretty yeah healthy position to take, right? It's just trying to trying to um, narrow that gap. I mean, I was I don't know whether Paul, you had any more more questions with regards to that specific issue at all. Um, uh, no, I had, I had more one to bring it back to what I was talking about earlier. But if, if you want to continue, Kieran, you can do. Um, I was going to ask him about. Uh, Labour voting one more time, but if you want to hear any, no, no, go for it. Because I was hoping to to turn towards um, the, the the EU election and and talk about that a little bit with regards to um, minority voting patterns and etc. I, uh, I think we, I think I think we can discuss both. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> so maybe Paul, what do you want to ask me about uh, uh, Labour voting then? Well, it's just just one more question I want to ask you, uh, and, and maybe it's a bit uh, 
maybe it's bringing up in you a bit too much, but there was um, I read an article in I think the Guardian about how, as you were saying, in 2015 the general elections, uh, BME votes were were um, of one third of them were for, for the Conservatives in 2015. Yeah, well, actually, mass- the, conser- the Conservatives hit one million epic minority votes in the general election for the first time in the history. Yeah, which is a massive change, obviously. Yeah. And there was a, you might have seen this quote, I'm not sure, but there's, there's, a, there's a person called Sander Katswala. He's a director. Oh, yes, he, yes, he works for a British Future. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. And he, he was saying that what he, what he thinks is as well, uh, and I'm not sure if he had an opinion on this, but he, he believes that Labour has, uh, the image of an on, the image as of a party that's an underdog. So the image is that they are kind of for the people who are lower down, as we said. Uh, people who are generally struggling with life in Germany. Yeah, sure. And then the kind of idea is that the Tories are the, are the trade up. So it's kind of it's kind of touching on what we t- talked about earlier about social mobility and if that makes a difference. Yeah. Do you think this is the case that Conservatives do uh, are that have the party of you know the C2Ss and and the kind of the, the trade up from Labour and Labour are the underdogs, or or is that again a simplification of how these parties? Um, pre- I think I think is interesting because I think Sundar Kotwal he actually produced a report for British Future which specifically discussed the um, ethnic minority voter patterns in, in the aftermath of the 2015 general election. I think we also have to look at issues surrounding economic management and leadership. I, th- I think that, I think more than anything these sort of considerations are you know. They're, they're taken regardless of one's ethnicity. I think that on themes of e- economic management, if you had to talk about the, say, the Cameron Osborne versus Ed Miliband and Ed Balls, I think it's generally the case that Cameron Osborne, they were, they were more trusted in terms of managing the economy in a competent fashion. I think in terms of leadership, I think if you had to look at Ed Miliband in particular, his uh, leadership skills Potentially, they they weren't particularly well rated in the well across the British mon- ethnic minorities in general. So I think there's an, there's an, those considerations that need to be need to be taken. But if you wanted to look at the British Indian community in particular, if you're looking at values such as entrepreneurship, personal responsibility, individual initiative, these are values which are very um, highly regarded within the British Indian community. And I think that Labour's message perhaps didn't resonate in the hearts and minds of those voters in particular, which is why they may have been more inclined to vote blue this time around. Yeah, I find it really interesting because I find that, you know, as I was talking before about the C2Ss with with Thatcher and then the Tories, it, yeah. am I right, I mean, again, it's going to be your, your, your knowledge area, but am I right in saying that the kind of shift of Labour to new Labour reflected that demand for C2S votes uh, and 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 kind of adapted to 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 the kind of new trend in 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 voting. And that if if Labour were to do that now, a lot of people would still think that Labour should become you know more new Labourish or, or whatever yeah. to, to reflect the, these demands. Still, is 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 that, is that I, true? I think I think, think what you're referring to, you're referring to like your your Essex man and Mondeo man. Yeah, 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 you know? sure, yeah. Your your aspira- aspirational types who really who really want, who, they're more. Not so much they would describe themselves as struggling, but they're quite keen to improve their lot in uh, in general. I'd say that Labour did particularly well amongst these voters under well under the new Labour project, you could say. Now maybe perhaps Labour don't particularly have a strong connection with these voters, but the Conservatives at the moment seem to be seem to be the main party for these group of voters now. So you could say that perhaps that well, Cameron has often said that he is the heir to Blair. So this should maybe not come as any surprise to us that perhaps the, there might not be much of a difference between the current Conservative Party under Cameron and New Labour, perhaps. The differences might be quite... Uh, yeah, it's not that they're both just as kind of... Uh as knowledgeable on how to adapt to a voter block uh, as each other. It's just interesting because I do think with Corbyn, he has that kind of uh, group of undecided voters or voters who don't vote at all. As a big, as, I mean, alternatives are quite low and there's a lot of people who don't vote because they don't, I think, believe in politics. That could yeah. be his group of voters that might actually vote for him because they might think that he has an actual change to make. Um, uh, but it's interesting to see how that, how that will pan out. I mean, Bernie Sanders right now in America is it was almost like a good parallel to to Corbyn, and he's had mixed results with his kind of tactics and so yeah. on. Yeah, so I, th- I think I think if we're making the comparison between Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders, it's very unlikely that he will be nominated by the yeah. Democrats. Uh, 
as a as a presidential candidate. I think we're looking at um, Jeremy Corbyn in particular. He may well command support from say you know strong parts of the say the Muslim population or the Black Caribbean and Black African uh, ethnic minorities. I think what you what we saw in 2015 with Ed Miliband was that where Labour did make gains, they tended to be in gains in their heartlands and amongst voters that already tend to vote Labour. I think what the challenge is now for the party is appealing to those who perhaps voted for a different party, specifically, you know, the Conservative Party and Liberal Democrats and how they managed to get those voters back. But I see the point that maybe Jeremy Corbyn, he might appeal to those young idealists, you know, people who may not be, who may not have been engaged with uh, conventional politics. Well, I think there needs to be a broader strategy at hand if Labour want to uh, be uh, be in government once again. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't seem it seems almost too focused at times, and other times not focused enough. Sometimes it seems yeah. that they're going for principles. It doesn't seem like they're going. They don't don't understand how to appeal to certain people. Yeah. There's no. There's no. There doesn't seem to be as much strategy there as it probably should do. And unfortunately, I think with the kind of young idealist angle. Yeah, I, I, from what I've seen in America, you know, Ron Paul was a very popular kind of younger dealist candidate, so it's Bernie yeah. Sanders now. Neither of them seem to be succeeding with that, you know, with that oh. angle. Um, and I know that, you know, usually, probably because we have an aging population that probably comes in as well, where we have a lot, a lot of elderly people who will vote for the safer option, especially because it, yeah. you know, it saves them. And, 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 and levels of turnout tend to be a lot higher within the older subsets of the population as well. So that's something Ex- that to be taken into consideration. Yeah, which is which is also slightly worrying. I find I know, for instance, and this is obviously you you wouldn't study this, but I know in say Croatia, a lot of Croatians complain about the fact that the, the biggest, the mostly because because of brain drain from Croatia to other countries, the older generations stay in stay in the country, so elder Croatians stay in Croatia and therefore vote for policies that that help them, which therefore you know makes it harder for younger people to to get yeah. their way in life, so they therefore emigrate again, and it's kind of a vicious cycle where that older turnout really kind of uh, cements the status quo and means that, and it kind of enforces brain drain, which therefore impoverishes the country and, and so on and so forth. It's quite sad. You, you, can almost, you can almost say that, that it's, it's almost like an intergenerational tension, which is reinforcing the status quo and it needs to exactly, yeah. it, a change in policy in general. Yeah. It's very interesting. And I guess, I guess it kind of, what well, I want to tie in with Kieran stuff is that you, you now see with, say, the EU voting and so on, you see there is a bit of kind of inter. In, you know, uh, intra-party politics, uh, which is or internal politics, which has resulted in. Um, oh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly imagine which party you were referring to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, UKIP, no, uh, obviously conservative. Well, then you see someone like Boris Johnson come out, and I, in my, you know, my opinion, and I hear uh, you're going to have more to say about this, but it does seem like he's, you know, he, he might not even necessarily, necessarily believe in Brexit, but he knows that it's a kind of strong stance to take. Uh, yeah. when his future, you know, when the Conservative leadership is coming up in three years' time and, and he has to kind of win popularity for that, you know. I mean, I, th- I think that I think us uh, us three and, well, large swathes of the country would agree that Boris's political ambitions have played a massive role in his decision to back the Leave campaign. I think that's pretty fair to say. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Kieran, I'm not sure what you want to say about the EU. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I was hoping to, to, to move into that now because it's obviously... I mean, for me, it's the most interesting and perhaps the most significant um, referendum that that we will get to to vote in. I mean, I, obviously, we can't predict the future, but I know it's probably going to be the most significant, um, you know, vote that I ever cast so far in my life. Uh, and that's on EU membership, and it's June, is it? Mid is it the mid June. This is going yeah. to take place in the UK. So I, I was just wondering about how. How ethnic minority groups, the ones you're studying, what they feel about the EU, how they view the EU positively, negatively, and perhaps what what their voting patterns suggest they're, they're going to vote for, and how that may may affect the wider the wider results of the referendum. I think that I think that within the um, the BME population, there are there are differing public attitudes amongst ethnic minority Britons on on the issue of European membership, and if you had to talk. If you have to talk about EU membership, I think a massive part of that you're going to have to talk about immigration as well, because there's been massive talk about the free movement of uh, free movement of labour principle, which are enshrined in the treaties. Um, it's interesting because the UKIP spokesman on migration and financial affairs, Stephen Wolf, himself of a ethnic minority background, he said that the ethnic minorities could actually provide the Leave campaign with a real boost by saying that if you're looking at um, Black Caribbeans, if you're looking at Pakistani and Bangladeshis. A significant proportion are actually located at the lower rungs of the labour market. 
So you could say that it's uh, so he, the point he's trying to make is that they're suffering from wage compression, perhaps the result of large scale EU migration. So he says there could be actually a there is actually a lot of potential for EU uh, well Euro skepticism within British ethnic minorities. But overall, if you're looking at a report which is produced by the Runnymede Trust, they actually showed that there are latently high levels of support for the EU amongst the ethnic minority population in Britain, who tend to express pro-EU sentiments due to concerns regarding uh, concerns over nativism in the UK. And but maybe perhaps because of their ethnic minority background, they have a naturally wider internationalist outlook. But the fact of the matter is that there are, there are a number of considerations that have been made across you know, ethnic minority groups in the country as to whether or not the, uh, individuals will vote to uh, stay or leave. Okay, and and so we can't really predict with regards to the trends uh, how this is going to affect I me. Mean, I haven't looked at the latest polling data yeah. with regards to the to the EU um, uh, membership referendum. I mean, I, I don't know what what the yes no is and whether that whether studies have looked at what the well. I mean, if, if we're referring to um, the polls of polls, there's a latest average of six polls from the the 25th of February to the 6th of March, which is uh, this is run by the National Centre of Social Research. It places 51 it places remain on 51 percent leave on 49 percent but different polls will tell you different things and perhaps maybe uh, referring to the polls is something that we shouldn't do too much in light of what happened uh, with the general election but if we're looking at if you're looking at maybe what um, certain campaigns how they should go about winning the ethnic minority votes I think that the argument surrounding immigration and Britain's immigration policy in particular is something that maybe they should focus on, where you've heard that perhaps both of you have heard this argument quite regularly, the idea of, say, an, an engineer from New Delhi, fluent in English, highly skilled, and from a country with close historical ties with the UK, he'll have to go for an extensive point-style process by virtue of not being within the European Union, while an unskilled individual born and brought up in Bratislava, having a relatively poor command of English, lacking those sophisticated skills, being from Slovakia, a country not particularly well known for sister connections, they have far more easier access to enter the UK due to the free movement of the Labour principle. And that's something that, maybe something that could work if um, for the Leave campaign if in terms of engaging with uh, ethnic minorities born and brought up in this country. Yeah, you know, it, it's significant and that particular issue is something that's affected me personally. I'm just Paul you know well well knows about i mean i don't want to get uh, talk about it too much on air but <laughs> my uh, my 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 fiance she's she's russian and it's been really difficult because of that because obviously russia's not in the not part of the european union at all and despite being highly qualified with loads of work experience i mean look we're talking about a girl with multiple masters degrees and has been a lawyer for most of her adult life and you know the, the difficulty and the limits put on her to come here to work are still you know are really tough uh, and it's caused all sorts of issues so um, that for me has, has been a particular you know an argument which has resonated more and more like well you know this is an issue um so it, it, it's torn me a little bit <laughs> because of that. So I find that really, you know, really interesting. But I think if we're looking at matters of fairness, I think I think the issue with that as well is that the vast, vast majority of migrants coming from within the European Union to the UK are white. While we're talking about ethnic minorities, particularly the Black Caribbean, Black African and the South Asian ethnic minority groups are visible minorities. So you could almost say here this is almost a race issue, potentially. So this is something that could could gain significant traction within ethnic with ethnic minorities if the Leave campaign choose to go down this route in terms of engaging with these ethnic minorities. I guess the problem is with the Leave campaign is they're usually seen, you know, someone like UKIP or they're usually seen as right wingers, which is quite interesting because with Scottish, Scottish evolution that was quite a almost left wing idea. It's just funny how two very similar principles are, are, are seen on different political spectrums. But you're right, it, it, it is a racial issue. Again, as someone who studied migration, you know, most of our borders, you know, have been have been created to keep out ethnic minorities, unfortunately. So most of our, you know, obstacles and so on, you know, ideas of kind of restricting dependence from coming to the country is down to the fact that we don't want to have ethnicities come in. Uh, you know, in America. Chinese migration in the early 1900s, I think, ended up, up creating passports because they were competing for, for jobs with other Americans and they didn't like it. And it was the same for in Australia, where we had, again, mass Asian, um, mass Asian kind of migration, which meant competition for jobs. And the consequence was a 
what they called a non-white migration ban until I think the 70s. So it, you're right. I think migration does usually kind of tread along racial lines, whether you know yeah. you like it, or, like it or not. And I'm doing that in a very, I'm saying that in a very academic way. Having studied that, I try to not, you know, try to not be as extreme as to call it racist, but it, it really is, like you say. Um, yeah. I, th- I think I, th- I think if I just want to elaborate, I, I think that more than anything, I think that I think the Leave campaign, I think as we can already see, that immigration is going to be at the centre of their strategy in terms of engaging with people and trying to trying to trying to basically deliver results where Britain votes to leave the European Union. And I just think, it, considering we've talked about ethnic minorities in general, I think that could be. I think that that scenario that what we discussed earlier, I think that's something that could be quite. Um, Quite successful. And it's something that the Remain campaign have to consider, and, and they have to think about arguments in terms of how to how they're going to deal with that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. I mean, that they're all the questions I had for you, for you, Rakib. So I don't know whether Paul, whether you had any more that you wanted to to ask. No, but Rakib has kind of succinctly and you know and 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 uh, comprehensively answered most of my questions. I'm kind of you know exhausted for words here. I'd love to ask more, but I, I'm, I'm lost. It's a brilliant interview so far, so I'm, I'm very happy. That's very good to hear. Okay. Is, uh, is, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that you find interesting you'd like other people to know, perhaps? I mean, I know you write about, you know, you publish articles and stuff, but but in the spoken word, perhaps your, your latest research, are there any, any, any final statements? <laughs> um, I, think we're pre- I think we've pretty much discussed everything that, um, everything that we could have, to be honest. Um, I would just say that if we're just... Uh, if we're talking at potentially, maybe we could, do, maybe if we wanted to talk a bit more about as to why the Indian, well, specifically, specifically why the British Indian vote is moving towards the Conservatives, I think maybe we could talk a little bit more about that, if that's okay. Yeah, go yeah, for it. Of course, yeah. yeah, I think um, one thing we have to discuss, and we have to look at the, we have to look at economics, and we have to look at you know policy surrounding welfare. If we're looking at uh, the Indian community in particular, they tend to have, well, firstly, they tend to be located at higher levels within the labour market. So what I'm saying there, they tend to be more represented in, you know, higher occupations and, you know, managerial and professional positions in comparison to, say, British Pakistanis and British Bangladeshis. Within the Indian community, and this is something that I think is vitally important, is that they ha- it is a significantly higher percentage of Indi- British Indian females in the labour market, so they have a higher uh, level of uh, female labour market participation. So uh, that would, by virtue, that would mean that there are more Indian households where there is two two streams of income. Now the issue here, if we're going to move on to fertility rates, is that the Indian a- Indian average is actually, in fact, according to a 2010 population studies paper, it's actually below the national average. While the British Bangladesh and British Pakistani communities, they tend to rank in the top two in terms of fertility rates. So what I'm saying here is that partly the reason, well, what could be a significant reason as to why we're saying British Indians moving towards the Conservatives is because there's a high proportion of two income small sized households, meaning that they have a lesser dependency on forms of welfare, which means they're more likely to push towards the Conservatives. While this is not so much the case for the British, Pakistani and British Bangladeshi communities as to why they are possibly remaining with Labour. And they're likely to remain with Labour because Jeremy Corbyn seems very passionate in terms of protecting forms of welfare. So I think that's something that maybe the Labour Party should consider. And that's also something that uh, the Conservative Party should uh, consider as well and take notice of. But also with, with a kind of higher birth rate, I guess the implication is that the yeah. future is more solid because you have more children who okay. will pro- probably be a, a allied towards labour, you know, being born and having, you know, and, and if that continues, there's just more and more labour sure. voters. But is, is that fair to say that that kind of, you know... That's... I think that's a very interesting point you brought there, Paul, because the, the, the point I, was, I made earlier on, which we were discussing, is that labour is also is already doing very well amongst Pakistani, uh, British Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. But they tend to be geographically concentrated at the moment, particularly looking at, say, you know, in in the West Midlands, some parts of uh, Northern England as well. But where the where the you could almost say that there are certain votes, even though it is one person, one vote. Well, there's there's a democratic idea. There are some votes which are actually worth more than others due to the fact that where they are located geographically, particularly if they're within a marginal constituency. Now we're referring to the towns I referred to earlier, such as Swindon, Watford, Milton Keynes, and and strategically, these are very important constituencies for well, the Conservative and Labour parties, and that's where you have your aspirational middle class Indians, which are a significant presence. And at the moment, they seem to be going one direction, and that's towards the Conservatives. 
it's quite it's quite interesting how much immigration has a massive impact on on our elections. Actually, I never I never really co- you know comprehended fully how that could happen because I guess I guess areas can completely change within decades. So say yeah. you, okay you know say with with, with say, say with refugees who end up having children who are British citizens. Let's say um, let's say there's a whole swathe of say Syrian refugees who associate with Labour because Labour didn't let's say bomb. You know, didn't didn't vote necessarily for bombing Syria recently. Let's let, let's just kind of hypothetically say that if Syrians take over, say if if a lot of Syrians move into say a certain region, they could completely re, re, re um completely transform that 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 constituency for voting. I mean, did I make myself clear there? This is yeah. that my, my, you know groups of my, migration groups could actually change how how uh, a party sees a certain area. It's it's very interesting. Yeah, I think it's what I also said that an important point there is, is for example, if you're looking at, at you know, that the Idi Amin's policy of Africanization, which led to the expulsion of uh, Ugandan Asians, a significant proportion of which were allowed to relocate in uh, Britain under Ted Heath, which, as you know, is a conservative government. You yeah. can actually see now within particularly the Ugandan uh, well, parts of the Asian community, which can trace trace back their roots back to, say, well, back to Uganda, you can say there that there's actually strong levels of conservative support. So you might be onto something in terms of the, that link that you've referred to. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and that, that, actually, the episode is very, by itself, I studied that for my dissertation. It's a very interesting episode of refugee history, um, which, funny enough, Ted Heath, his, his government didn't want the Ugandan Asians to arrive. Um, but that's another story. Yeah, but it, it just it's just kind of... It would be interesting to see. Is it interesting to see how the makeup of of a certain area ethnically, as it changes, how that vote will change as well, um, and how over time, what could be traditional hotspots for for the Conservatives might become traditional hotspots for you no know, Labour, or I guess you know if you look at Scotland, that soon became S and P, um, because of the way they reflected that vote better, and how Scotland probably probably changed as well. It, yeah. it's, it's just fascinating the kind of ever changing face of politics. Of course. All right, great stuff. I mean, do you want to, should we wrap this up, Paul? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much for being with us, Rack. I'd really appreciate it. And, you know, you have so much knowledge. It's great just to listen to it. And it's a fascinating topic, especially with such important uh, elections coming up. It's going to be really interesting to find out um, what happens. I'm sure we're all, all dead excited, all us p- politics nerds. Um, of course, as always. Yeah. So thank you again. And um, cheers, Paul, for being here. And we're going to... We're going to get another interview done in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. So look out for that, people. And goodbye and thank you again. Lovely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome.